Well, good evening, everybody, and welcome to the 2013 awards evening. Always one of the, the best events for me on the, the calendar for UNSW Law. I'm, for those of you I haven't had the pleasure of meeting yet, my name is David Dixon. I'm Dean of the, the Law School. Let me begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of this land, the Bidjigal people, and pay my respects to their elders past and present and to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island people at this university. As Dean, one of the really best parts of the, the job that I do is dealing with our extraordinarily talented students. Entry to this law school is now so competitive and the quality of our students is so high. But even amongst the excellent, some stand out and that is really what tonight is, is all about. Um, if I can just diverge from my script for a second just to talk about excellence and just to breach a, a confidence. And I know that we're, we're all friends here and so you won't um, repeat this outside the room, of course. Um, it's a, an embargo piece of news which came through today about the QS rankings, which are one of the three major ranking systems of international universities. Um, we've done particularly well this year. Uh, the, the law school shot up. Uh, 18 places in the QS rankings to be, to be ranked 12th in the world, which I think if we're, t we're talking about recognising... <laughs> if we talk about recognising excellence, I'd like to recognise the excellence of my colleagues in the, in the law school who have made that possible. Looking back over the, the, the law school's 40-plus years tradition, one thing that we didn't do so much in the past was to do what we're doing tonight, which is acknowledging and celebrating excellence. For reasons that I've never really understood, it was thought somehow that celebrating excellence and our commitment to social justice were somehow incompatible. But today our social justice activities are deeper and more substantial than they've ever been, as a mass of our students in particular take part in internships and clinics, both uh, domestically and, and internationally. Celebrating excellence complements rather than, than goes against that, that commitment to social justice in the law school. Today, we're proud to congratulate and to acknowledge the extraordinary talent of our leading students. Um, we're going to begin with a, a guest speaker, and our, our guest speaker is someone who really, for me, exemplifies the way in which you can combine academic excellence and commitments to social justice. Rebecca Gilson is an alumna of this law school who had the misfortune to be taught by me many years ago, who had survived nonetheless. She's now the principal of Morris Blackburn. Her practice focuses on class actions in the areas of price fixing, failed investment schemes, and product liability. Uh, a few of her major cases have included a, a series of class actions regarding failed heart devices, landmark litigation for a child immigration de detainee against the Commonwealth and against detention center operators, and a test case about whether human genes can be patented. Rebecca also acts for Greenpeace, carries out work for her firm's social justice practice is, the director, is one of the directors of PIAC and a director of Guthrie House. Uh, uh, also until recently, I managed to miss this. I still hope that we've got some tape of this, which we, one day I get to see. She was a, uh, a legal correspondent for the 10 Breakfast TV show and also a blogger with the Daily Telegraph, providing day-to-day uh, -day advice on, on legal issues. So it's my great pleasure to introduce Rebecca to you. Thank you. David, academic staff, students and families, it's such an honour to be back here at my old law school addressing you this evening. This is what I'm going to call the Oh, the Places You'll Go speech. It's a cliche, but after thinking about what I wanted to say tonight, I realised that one of, what I wanted to say is more or less a less creative and legally oriented version of Dr. Zeus's popular book. So I read the book again, 
affirmed for myself that it deserves its place as the English-speaking world's most popular graduation present and got over being self-conscious about referring to it. And just in case you're getting worried, I know you're not graduating tonight. This is an awards night and you're here to be presented with awards and scholarships that recognise your intelligence, your hard work and your aptitude for law. You are here to be acknowledged and to celebrate your achievements with your families. So let me start with a short reading from Dr Zeus. You have brains in your head, you have feet in your shoes. You can steer yourself any direction you choose. You're on your own and you know what you know and you are the guy who'll decide where you go. I want to talk to you about the incredible skills and opportunities that you'll acquire through your law degree and what a privilege it is to be studying law at a prestigious law school like this. I want to talk to you about thinking broadly about what you might do with those skills and that privilege. Before I do, I'll tell you briefly who I am, although I think David's done a very generous job of that. I'm a partner in a plaintiff law firm called Morris Blackburn. I didn't hear much about plaintiff law firms at university and perhaps you haven't either. I had to go all the way to England to look back and realise that this type of work and this type of firm existed in Australia. I specialise in bringing class actions for shareholders of public companies, against shonky investment operators, against companies involved in price fixing and against manufacturers of faulty medical devices. Class actions are the biggest and most exciting litigation going on in Australia. The cases are intellectually and legally intense, they involve the top barristers in the country and they're defended by top litigation partners in the best firms around. Even the superior courts are competing with each other to host them. I had no idea that my passion for social justice would land me up doing this kind of work. Along the way I've also had a lot of fun acting for Greenpeace for years and the great fortune of being involved in a number of cutting edge pro bono cases that I'll talk about a bit later. My firm also does industrial work for unions, employment and discrimination work for employees, dust diseases work for dying people who've been exposed to asbestos in their working lives and medical negligence cases for people who are harmed by doctors negligent, of negligence, often families with brain damaged children. I and my colleagues get a great deal of satisfaction out of using our law degrees to do this kind of work and, and in helping our clients who are usually at a very vulnerable point in their life. A law degree, and particularly a law degree of the standard achieved by the people receiving prizes and scholarships here tonight, provides you with lots of choices about what to do in the world beyond university. A law degree instills an intellectual rigour and a worth e e <laughs> work ethic that can take you almost anywhere. Indeed, this country's first Prime Minister and our current Prime Minister were both practising lawyers prior to entering politics. Let's not forget that Barack Obama was a practising civil rights attorney and constitutional law academic before he entered politics. There are many more. Matisse, Mandela, Gandhi, John Cleese. Though John Cleese didn't practice and apparently Matisse got appendicitis as soon as he started work in a law firm and never went back. <laughs> to give you some ideas or even in thinking about this speech and the diversity of outcomes that law degrees can lead to, I reflected on what my closest mates from university were doing now. Three of them are partners in law firms. One's a partner in McKinsey in Brazil. One's in sports administration. One was until recently the CEO of a listed company, one is a barrister, one has a PhD in economics and an academic post in a law school in the United States, one's the international head of media for Microsoft, one's a founding partner of a corporate advisory firm, one's just appointed head of comedy at the ABC, and one's a film producer who recently won an Academy Award for producing The King's Speech. I think that covers most bases, but only four of 14 of us are practicing lawyers. When you're thinking about what you might do with yourself next once you graduate, don't forget to consider being a lawyer. <laughs> Despite reports about high levels of stress and depression in the profession, it can be a deeply satisfying career in terms of intellectual challenges, social engagement, and the range of experiences you'll have and the people and industries that you'll come in contact with. In the last 15 years, I've had to immerse myself in things as diverse as hearts and prosthetic heart devices, knees and prosthetic knees, contraception and fertility, medical device engineering, psychiatry, big box shopping centres, 
by which I mean the type of drive-in places like Supercenter, logging, cardboard box manufacturing, construction, the immigration detention system, charities, tax structures and the constitution. If you're thinking about being a practicing lawyer, also be aware of the fact that there are lots of opportunities out there beyond the obvious ones in the prestige law firms. The big law firm opportunities are attractive and with very good reason. They usually provide terrific, and terrific training and further opportunities both within and outside those firms. But there are other very satisfying legal careers that, may not, that you may not hear much about at university. Consider, for example, areas of law that are not the most prestigious areas, such as family law and personal injuries law. There are enormous opportunities for high-level graduates like you in those areas. There's also a great deal of satisfaction to be gained from the work in those areas. Think about doing plaintiff law. It's really fun to create, shape and progress a case. I suspect it actually might be more fun than denying and defending them. Let me tell you briefly about some of the experiences that have given me the greatest pleasure in my career as a practicing lawyer. The first case I want to talk about is one that David referred to. It's the case that I brought for Cheyenne Badre. When Cheyenne was five years old, his parents and he fled from Iran because of their fear of persecution. Theirs was a risky journey to Australia, but nothing was to prepare them for the horror they experienced at Woomera Immigration Detention Centre. Within a year of arriving, Cheyenne had developed post-traumatic stress disorder, having witnessed at close range riots, fires, hunger strikes, and adults attempting to commit suicide in front of him. His condition deteriorated further until, after much pleading from the medical staff at Woomera Detention Centre, he and his family were transferred to a detention centre in a capital city. Cheyenne got worse and worse. He stopped eating, he stopped drinking, and his condition became life-threatening. He ferried backwards and forwards to Westmead Hospital, I think, for a total of 83 days, and the pattern would be the same every time. He'd go to hospital, they'd rehydrate him, he'd start drinking and eating again, he'd be returned to the detention centre, <clears throat> and he'd stop. The doctors treating him begged the authorities to release him and his mother into the community to avoid exposure to more trauma, but the department refused. Eventually, against the advice of treating doctors, the department and the minister agreed to release Cheyenne to a foster family while his parents remained in detention. When that didn't work, which was hardly surprising, they eventually released the mother and the, mother and the, the other baby to look after the fragile Cheyenne in the community. And seven months later, the family were granted temporary protection visas and all of them were released from detention. Sometime after that, the family approached my firm wanting to know if they could do anything about Cheyenne's treatment. They were quite terrified to take any steps because their visas at that point weren't permanent. The most I could say to them was that in this country, unlike Iran, the government was generally not vindictive and the rule of law prevailed. They commenced proceedings for negligence and trespass to the person for the way that Cheyenne was treated in detention. What was meant to be a fairly straightforward and quick personal injury case didn't turn out that way. This was the first time the government had been sued for compensation for causing psychiatric injuries to an immigration detainee. The case was viciously defended by the government and at least on one occasion I had reason to question my advice about vindictiveness and the rule of law. Also, during the trial the family's temporary protection visas had expired and weirdly, the government hadn't issued the visas that were supposed to follow on immediately after that. So the family were momentarily visaless, not being sure whether they were going to have to return to Iran. In the trial, the mother and father were cross-examined for days and days, much longer than is usual. It was suggested to them at various times that they were killing their child because they wanted to get out of detention. There were many other terrible suggestions put to them in the course of this trial. The family were under massive pressure and I wouldn't have forgiven them for stopping it. In fact, I can't believe to this day their courage and their desire to attain justice for their son somehow kept them going. Eventually, on the 63rd day of the trial, the case settled. And, somewhat strangely, within half an hour of the settlement, the government telephoned through the permanent protection visas that had been outstanding. The case settled for an amount of money that was sufficient for the family to buy a house in the western suburbs of Sydney and to provide them with a stable base from which to send the children to school and for the mother to set up a home daycare and earn some income. 
Cheyenne turned 18 in January this year and the house has just been transferred to him. Nothing has given me a greater sense of professional satisfaction or of putting my law degree to good use than enacting for that family and getting them a house in the western suburbs. More recently, I've been invo involved in another exciting case, which is a challenge to the patenting of human genes. The case is about the BRCA2 gene, which is the gene that indicates disposition to breast cancer when it has certain mutations on it. Do you know that if you have those mutations on your BRCA2 gene and you have the, your gene extracted and put in a test tube, you don't actually own it anymore. Somebody else does, a company. This creates a monopoly right to test for and to study these mutations. There's a debate about where the public interest lies in this situation, but in my view, quite clearly, the greater public interest is having our fundamental building blocks available for everyone in science and medicine to research and study. And I also have a difficulty with the concept of, of my body being owned by somebody, let alone somebody I've never met. So we've brought a case to challenge that practice of the Australian Patent Office handing out these patents to biotech companies. We were unsuccessful at first instance. We've appealed and the appeal will be heard by the full federal court in August. The US Supreme Court on the 15th of April this year heard argument in a like case to ours. I've read the transcript of that argument and I think the tea leaves look quite good for people who are opposed to gene patents. Again, being involved in that sort of case is immensely satisfying. So returning to where I started, to my theme. Think about what makes you happy and satisfied. Is it helping disadvantaged people? Is it being intellectually challenged? Is it the love of law itself? Is it prestige, money, building a business, doing deals, mentoring others, being creative? Think really hard about what it is and think creatively about the places that you might find those needs met. Go and talk to lawyers in practice and find out what it's like in their area of work. Find out who it is that you'll work for if you accept a job that's offered to you and find out whether they're known to be a good manager of people or not. Ask about their retention rates and whether or not they're known to have good management skills. Not thinking about what it is that makes you happy, not thinking about how to match what you do with your law degree with what you need and working for bad managers are the sorts of things that will land you up in those statistics of depressed lawyers that I talked about before. Once again, congratulations to those of you who are receiving prizes and scholarships tonight. I hope to see you in the legal profession in coming years. And to finish, another quote from Dr. Zeus. So be sure when you step, step with care and great tact, and remember that life's a great balancing act. Just never forget to be dexterous and deft, and never mix up your right foot with your left. And will you succeed? Yes, you will indeed. 98 and 3 quarter percent guaranteed. Thank you. <laughs>Thank you, Rebecca, you see what I mean. Um, now, onto the presentation of prizes, and I'd, uh, I'd like to invite the prize winners to come down to the front, and we will proceed with the, the prize giving. The, the way we, we do this, I'll call on each donor of the prize to come up to say a few words about their prize before presenting it. And I, I'd just like to, to say thank you to our, our prize donors, who range from the largest commercial law firms to down to individuals, and they make tonight's uh, presentations possible. The UNSW Law Prizes are awarded to the best performing student in each stage, which usually means year level, of the programs taught by the law school, the LLB, the JD, and our master's programs. And the, the first prize to be awarded tonight is the Dixon Family Indigenous Law Prize, which goes to the best performing student in our indigenous pre-law program. I hasten to make clear that this prize is nothing to do with me. The prize is given by two great friends of this law school, Marion and Harry Dixon, and it's wonderful to have as the presenter of tonight's prize their, their daughter, who is both an alumna of this law school and now a professor within it, Professor Rosalind Dixon.
Well, it's a great pleasure to be here this evening. This prize was created by my parents after I graduated from the law school, uh, and I have been away for almost all the years that it's been in existence, but now happily back uh, in part of the UNSW Faculty of Law community, and so it's lovely to be here this evening. So the brief words about the prize are the connection to the Dixon family and also what it means to us about UNSW and the Faculty of Law. The first is that my parents are both lawyers and I'm obviously a lawyer and we've all regarded the opportunity to earn a law degree as a great privilege and joy and uh, it's a celebration of that to uh, celebrate it and share it with others and also to see um, that not everyone enters the law school or the legal profession via the most conventional means. My father and I are on the conventional side, but my mother came to the law having been an English teacher, uh, was a legal academic and law reform um, professional for a long time, and actually was admitted to the law school only at the age, sorry, admitted to legal practice only at the age of 59. So like many people who enter the pre-law program, they come to law with many other careers and life experiences behind them, and that is a shared aspect of our family experience that we celebrate with them. Uh, the Dean has generously mentioned our connection as a family to the law school and I think the gift and, and the prize is, is supposed to very much see those twin commitments to social justice and academic excellence that we all uh, take such great pride in. On the social justice side, the sense that the role of Indigenous people in law schools and legal institutions is absolutely critical to the vibrancy and success of those institutions and to social justice more generally. Uh, and the sense that we do not all have the same educational opportunities in our early life that allow the door to this great institution to be open. And the prize itself celebrates excellence by those who enter that program and therefore brings those two commitments together. So this evening it is a great pleasure for me to be here and to celebrate the recipient of this year's Dixon Indigenous Family Law Prize, which is Genevieve Westbury. Thanks, Rosalind. and congratulations, Genevieve. Secondly, the Law Society of New South Wales Prize goes to the best performing student in stage one of the LLB, and this prize is presented by Ross Everett, the Senior Vice President of New South Wales Law Society and Principal of Everett Evans Solicitors. Thank you, David. It's a pleasure and an honour to be presenting this year's Law Society of New South Wales prize on behalf of the 26,000 solicitors in this state. I extend my warm congratulations to you, Zhong Wei, whose academic endeavours in his first year of a Bachelor of Laws augurs well for his future and the future of our profession. Education is the key that opens many doors and it doesn't end when you get your degree. It's an ongoing process of continuing legal education, training and professional development aimed at making you the best that you can be. It's about being committed to upholding the rule of law, to the pursuit of social justice and to maintaining the highest of ethical behaviours. These are the values that at the, are at the heart of the profession and by supporting undergraduates, the Law Society of New South Wales is seeking to instill these values early in a student's career and to promote the importance of lifelong learning. Zhang Wei's achievement is a testament to his fine mind, to his work ethic and a commitment to excellence in his chosen field. It's also a testament to the dedicated teaching staff and the opportunities available to students at the University of New South Wales Law School. We look forward to welcoming Zhang Wei to the profession. I have been the chairman of the licensing committee for several years, Zhang Wei, and I look forward to the day that you will be admitted to practice. I call Zhang Wei to receive the best performing student in stage one of the Bachelor of Laws. Asher's prize is for the best performing student in stage two of the LLB to be presented by uh, Peter McCulloch, 
partner at Ashurst and an alumnus of this law school. Peter. Thank you. Um, Ashurst has long recognised that this university uh, has here uh, a, a law faculty that is obviously one of Australia's finest. Um, and what we've seen over the years is the quality not just of the lawyers that this law school produces, but the quality of the people that it produces. And we're really delighted to be able to contribute in a small way to provide some recognition of uh, the excellence of, the, of some of the students here. Um, we really are delighted to, to be able to do that. Um, I think the main point I would make is, on behalf of the partners and the staff at the firm, is that we really do hope, or fondly hope, that uh, Aaron will use the money, the prize money, um, if not completely, foolishly, at least unwisely. <laughs> um, so, so with that, I'm pleased to announce that uh, Aaron Kiley, oops, is the recipient of the Ashurst Prize. Aaron's one of our students who somehow managed to do a million things in her life, as well as excelling academically, volunteering at Lifeline, uh, working in our, the UNSW UN Society. The thing that she's really in my good books about is she says that her favourite subject is criminal law, which she says is, is juicier and appeals to her black sense of humour. Uh, On to the, the Herbert Smith Freehills Prize for the best performing student in stage three of the LLB. Uh, this, one, this prize is to be presented by a great friend of this law school, Nick Carney, who is a senior associate at Herbert Smith Freehills, uh, a UNSW alumnus who also I think I had the, the, the uh, pleasure of teaching. He's a member of the UNSW Council and also a member of the, the Faculty's Advisory Council. And I'd just like to recognize also uh, Herbert Smith Freehills support for this faculty which has been uh, so so extensive they've supported uh, kingsford legal center by giving us a solicitor for more than 21 years now they also support our library and the new law and economics initiative so nick Ladies and gentlemen, um, Dean Dixon, thank you very much for that warm introduction and for those kind words about, um, about Herbert Smith Freehills. Um, Herbert Smith Freehills is enormously proud of its uh, long lasting and very deep connections with the university and with the Faculty of Law. Um, and I'm very grateful that they allow me the time to have the involvement uh, that I have. Um, the connections are many and deep. Um, many of our staff are former alumni of this, um, of this great um, law faculty. Um, many, uh, there are a number of paralegals who are in this room who are current paralegals. Um, in fact, one of them's winning an award and he was visiting my office to uh, collect some boxes today. Um, so um, as you move up the rungs, you don't have to collect boxes. Um, I'm a senior associate now and I, I uh, only have to do that once a week. Um, the firm is, as I said, has many connections um, and they're very proud of them. Many uh, former staff, um, many of our staff are, are alumni. We have current staff at Freehills who teach here and lecture here. Um, the Chancellor of the University is a former partner of the firm. Um, the firm sponsors the Law Library. Um, that I could go on, um, the connections are many. Uh, we're enormously proud to be able to sponsor the prize for the, um, this particular prize, the Herbert Smith Freehills Prize, which is a prize for the best performing student in stage three of the Bachelor of Laws. And that prize goes to Nicola Lucy Golan. Nicola's favourite subject is uh, property. She says that she likes it because it intersects with everyday life. It's a great example. I remember when I did property law at law school a million years ago, it, of many things property law did, it certainly didn't intersect with everyday life. It, it, it's a great example of how things that we do here in, in what I've seen often as you know, straight black letter law, law subjects are also, also taught in a, a contextual or theoretical way and very much 
down to uh, my colleague Br Brandon Edgeworth, who's sitting, trying to avoid my gl glance in the front row here, who leads our property law team. Um, on to the next prize, the Baker and McKenzie Prize. This is for the best performing st student in stage four, fourth year of the LLB program, uh, to be presented by Kate Muir, National Talent Director at uh, Baker and McKenzie. Thank you, Kate. Hello, I'm delighted to be here this evening to be part of recognising the outstanding performance of students uh, at the University of New South Wales. I'm in that group of people that Rebecca talked about, the former lawyers, the ones who chose a different path on their way through. Um, but I echo Rebecca's comments about uh, how wonderful a law degree can be in opening doors for you in all manner of professional areas. As with Herbert Smith Freehills, Baker and Mackenzie has a long relationship with this university. Uh, I looked into the numbers and almost a quarter of our partners in, a, uh, in the Sydney office were originally uh, were studied at this university and a similar number of all of our lawyers are in that category. And we find today when we're recruiting summer clerks and graduates that a significant number of many of the best performing students um, are from the University of New South Wales. We're always looking for ways that we can get to know and actively engage with the university and the student body. And as a global law firm, and in particular this year we're celebrating 50 years as a law firm in Asia Pacific, uh, we are always valuing the diversity of the student body here at the University of New South Wales and the quality and breadth of the education. Um, and the comments earlier around the commitment to social justice is something that we also think is very important in our students, um, in seeing students come through, uh, understanding that whatever area of law you choose to practice in, um, if it is a commercial area, that there's still an obligation to give back to the community. We're very committed to recognising and supporting and uh, developing excellent in lawyers of the past, uh, present and the future. And so it is with really great pleasure, pleasure that I'd like to ask Leah Grohlman to come to the stage to receive the Baker McKenzie Prize for Best Performing Student. <laughs> I should add that Le Leah Grohlman is a, a serial underachiever. She's only won the, this equivalent prize each, each, in each of the first, second and third year now. Fourth year, and you're back again. Thank you. Uh, I think another cause of celebration for, for Leah is that she, uh, she's passionate about public law plans to go on to work in that field and is making a great start in that by going on to be associate when she graduates to Justice Virginia Bell in the High Court. Uh, just about, there's been a number of alumni have been mentioned tonight, and I, I just, it's, it's wonderful looking around the room, seeing how many of our alumni are here and how, how many alumni's children are, are coming to the, the law school. And the, they make a, a, a wonderful contribution, starting, I should acknowledge, in the, the second row here, are, our Deputy Chan Chancellor, Gillian Siegel, uh, one of a, a, a number of really wonderful UNSW alumni families. On to the Minter Ellison Prize for the best performing student in stage five of the LLB to be presented by, this is the Minter Ellison Prize to be presented by Majid Gurgis. Thank you. Thank you, Dean. Um, I'm a uh, partner in the financial services section at uh, Minter Ellison and I practice in superannuation law. So for my sins, I end up having to practice in all the areas that people hate at university, tax, <laughs> trusts, equity, the lot. But I'm also involved in the summer clerkship program and the graduate hiring program. And it's in that capacity that I see the really fine uh, graduates and students that come through the university. It's my pleasure tonight to present the Minter Ellison Prize for Best Performing um, Student in Stage 5 of the Bachelor of Laws program. Um, we give this prize because of our commitment, an ongoing commitment I should say, to investing in the legal industry and, and the students coming through. We believe in rewarding um, excellence and, and hard work as a way of promoting the ongoing um, desire to, to, to better people, a better than oneself um, throughout all the stages of their career, including the early stages. Now, our, our philosophy is that um, learning doesn't stop here at university, it, though it starts here, it, it, doesn't, it certainly doesn't stop, and um, our training program at work reflects that for that very reason. 
Um, but we also believe it's more than just developing expertise. It's about developing the person uh, in, in a well-rounded sense, very much in the way our first speaker spoke about this tonight. But it all starts here, and on that note, we'd like to present um, the prize for the best performing student, stage five, a call on Emily Burke to receive that prize. Emily's another one of our, our truly extraordinary students. She's, she just got back from the Jessup Moot finals in Washington, D.C., the Jessup Moot, the leading international moot competition, where she was awarded the prize for the best speaker in the entire competition. I think that deserves a round of applause. <laughs> She, Emily's the executive editor of the UNSW Law Journal and is going on to work when she graduates as an associate to Chief Justice French in the High Court. On now to uh, the second stream of our programmes, the, the Juris Doctor. The Allen's Prize goes to the best performing student in stage one of the, the JD programme. Just something about the JD programme. This has been something that we've been running for about four years now, and it's made an, an extraordinary contribution to the law school in bringing in people of many, many different backgrounds and experiences, as you will see in a minute when the people come up to collect their prizes. Um, this is the, the Allens Prize. Uh, Allens is a, another of the, the, the great commercial law firms which provides invaluable support to the faculty in so many ways, not least if I can give a plug to hosting a uh, a morning seminar with uh, a, a, a true legal superstar, Judge Rakoff from the US Federal Court, at, which will be hosted at Allen's on May the 15th. And I'll call on uh, Ian McGill from Allen's, another partner, another uh, UNSW alumnus, to present the Allen's Prize. Thanks. Ian. Thank you, David. Um, congratulations to all of the prize givers uh, tonight and to all of the families that uh, are here to share in the, uh, the joy of um, so much excellence. Uh, Allens is very uh, pleased to be associated with this prize and we're very pleased to be associated with the law school. Uh, over, we did a, a bit of sums this morning and um, I'm pleased to say that we support the law school by employing, to date, over 300 graduates from the law school. So that's a I think a, a one sign of our commitment. This is a great opportunity for me also to give free advice to, um, to, to young law students. And um, having been given it, thank you, David, I'm gonna take the opportunity. And my, my free advice to you is um, think about what Rebecca uh, said tonight, um, weigh her words. Um, the, a career in, in law is a wonderful uh, career and I've been privileged uh, to have uh, enjoyed it for 30 years and uh, over 30 years and I would say to you um, as students and as you go through law school there's no doubt that it's very hard work it's a very demanding career but never lose sight of your idealism and what motivates you as a human being never lose sight of that and as you progress in the law sure you will owe duties to um, your clients, you will owe duties um, to your, your firm, but your principal and overriding duty as an officer of the, uh, the court is to the rule of law, and it's worth just bearing that in mind. But no doubt there is hard work involved, and it's, um, in a sense, it's not getting any easier. Um, but I just thought I'd read a little bit of advice that was written on September 25, 1860. Um, this advice was written to J. M. Brockman, Esquire. Dear Sir, yours of the 24th, this author was most efficient, yours of the 24th, asking, quote, the best mode of obtaining a thorough knowledge of the law, close quote, is received. The mode is very simple, though laborious and tedious. It's only to get the books and read and study them carefully, begin with Blackstone's commentaries, and after reading it thoroughly through, say, twice, take up Chitty's pleadings, Greenleaf's evidence, and Story's equity and succession. Yours sincerely, Abraham Lincoln. <laughs> I have great pleasure on calling uh, Samuel Leon Gerber to receive the Allen's Prize for Best Performance Student. <laughs> 
in year one. And if you look at your, your program for tonight, you'll see that uh, Samuel has got an extraordinary achievement of also receiving five Dean's List prizes. Coming, that means he came top of five separate courses this year, more than anybody else in the law school. So many congratulations. On, on to the Banky Haddock Fiora Prize. This is for the best performing student in stage two of the JD program to be presented by Julie Robb, partner at Banky Haddock Fiora and a, another UNSW alumna, Julie. Thank you very much. Um, it's a privilege to be here to confer the Banky Haddock Fiora Prize for the best performing student in stage two of the Juris Doctor program. Um, the firm has awarded a University of New South Wales Law Award since I think 2006, but this is the first time the honour has fallen to me to present it. Um, Banky Haddock Fiora is a specialist intellectual property and media firm, and the prize is usually given by my partner, Simon Kneebone, who is tonight overseas at an international meeting of trademark professionals and we might have to tussle for who's going to be here next year. Um, Banky Haddock Fiora greatly enjoys its association with the university. This prize in the Juris Doctor program is a particularly happy event for me as a graduate, as a graduate of its predecessor program, the Graduate Law program. I look forward to meeting William and to hearing of his story to date. Um, the firm also thoroughly enjoys employing people who have had uh, various past experience. Um, and I'm just wondering whether I might be able to confer my degree to a Juris Doctor, which sounds so much smarter than an LLB. <laughs> William Tidmarsh, congratulations on being the best performing student in stage two in the Juris Doctor. William works in the airline industry and hopes to use his degree to look at and solve some of the industry's legal and policy challenges, but not, he says, before having a long holiday when he finishes. Thank you. The uh, Truman Hoyle Prize is for the best performing student in third, the third year, stage three of the JD program. It's, this is to be presented by another great friend of the, the law school, Shane Barber, managing partner of Truman Hoyle and a generous supporter of the law school in many ways, Shane. Thank you very much. Well, on behalf of the partners and staff of Truman Hoyle, it's a great pleasure to be here and also to celebrate a long uh, association that we've had with the university. Um, I think this is also the, the fourth year that we've presented this particular prize. Uh, Truman Hoyle is a firm uh, that is born out of many of the sentiments that we hear tonight. It's a group of people who have left the mainstream uh, world, so we thought, uh, and set up our own firm that sp specialises in telecommunications and technology law, and uh, we liked being a standalone uh, little group of people. Uh, so that's the reason why we've recently announced our uh, uh, association with a global firm called Bird and Bird. Uh, so we're going back into that world, but we have... Uh, I think experienced um, uh, an enormous uh, sense of satisfaction out of finding our own way in the law. And to all of you tonight, I would say, take the advice of those of us who've been doing this for a long time. If we can look back on the decisions that we made or didn't make uh, 25 years ago, and we could uh, take the uh, advice that we've heard tonight, I think we would make decisions that would make us very happy and fulfilled people. Uh, one of the things that we really enjoy about our association with the University of New South Wales is its uh, combined commitment to social justice programs and also to academic excellence. And, and I think uh, all of the University of New South Wales graduates that we've employed uh, have demonstrated a, an enormous roundedness that has been a great contribution to our firm. Indeed, for the past 11 years, uh, all of our managing partners, and there's been more than one, have been uh, alumnus uh of the University of New South Wales. So uh, on behalf of the partners and staff of Truman Hoyle, I'd like to present the Truman Hoyle Prize to Simon Philip Lindsay.
As, as you may gather, Simon is uh, in, an officer in the Australian Navy, uh, one of the, the, the kind of people that I mentioned who bring a, a great breadth of experience to our, to our classes. He's heading off to London next year to work in corporate, corporate law. It says here, do, actually I'm not sure if we gave the prize to the right person, it says he enjoys going to Bulldogs games. <laughs> Dear me. And he says his favourite subject was, was uh, his favourite lecturer was, quote, an entertaining Dennis Harley. <laughs> I've heard Dennis called a few things, so that's only one of them. <laughs> and next on to the Public Defenders Prize. This prize is to recognise excellence in our postgraduate programmes, our master's programmes. And t tonight, the, um, in a slight irony perhaps, the Public Defenders Prize is to be presented by Nicholas Cowdery, AMQC. Nick, Nick Cowdery, as people here will know, was DPP of, of New South Wales from 1994 to 2010, had an extraordinary career doing, uh, doing great work in fighting the good fight for uh, the, a good approach to criminal justice. And he's also a very, I'm very glad to say, a visiting professorial fellow at, at the, the law school. Nick. Thank you, David. My apologies for being late, Rebecca, but uh, I've just finished a three-hour class with some of the superb students in this university. Don't say that the university doesn't get its pound of flesh. Um, no, I. That's the best. No, we'll talk about that. Um, no, I haven't become a public defender, uh, but I suspect it's not the first time that an old prosecutor has come to the assistance of the public defenders. Um, I know there aren't any here tonight. I'm not even sure that they know that I'm here tonight. <laughs> But be that as it may, uh, I'm drawing on my experience as a defender in Papua New Guinea back in the 1970s and putting on my temporary public defender hat for this very pleasant task that's been given to me tonight. Uh, and it is a great pleasure to be able, on behalf of the public defenders of New South Wales, to present this prize. Uh, it goes to Therese Paula Sands, who took a year off work uh, to qualify as a Master of Human Rights, Law and Policy. Uh, and it's particularly fitting that uh, uh, perhaps that, that I was asked to present this because the connecting factor between prosecutors and defenders is in fact the protection of human rights. So this couldn't be more relevant, I don't think. Uh, Therese uh, works with People with Disability Australia and she's a member of a non-government organisation delegation to the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. So she is uh, very strongly committed to the cause of human rights and for those who are not in a position to be able to um, exert those rights fully for themselves very often. So uh, please, I ask uh, Therese Paula Sands to come forward and to accept the prize. Now it's, it's time to recognise our scholarship recipients and the people who provide the scholarships for them. Uh, could I ask our Scientia scholars first to come up on the stage to my, to my left? Also, the other scholarship uh, recipients, if they could come down to the, the front of the, the, the room as well. But f firstly, our, our Scientia students, whose names are appearing on the screen there behind me. The Scientia students are the extraordinary young people who achieve ATARs of 99.9 or, or above in the HSC. In other words, they get the they get to, to being in that very, very top band of achievement. The, it's been my great pleasure to, to 
have dealings with our Centre students over the last few years and the thing that's really struck me is the way that they manage somehow to combine academic overachievement with all kinds of external activity and involvement in, in the outside world. Uh, special mention just for a, a couple of them, Olivia Byers, whose mother, sister and brother all studied at UNSW and Denise Kaye who follows her sister here uh, to UNSW. So congratulations to our Sienta students tonight. Next to the other scholarships, uh, I'd like to thank our, the donors of our scholarships, many of whom are present for the provision of scholarships helping students through their studies. These scholarships go to students who have been awarded scholarships recognizing exceptional achievement and also social and economic disadvantage. These two things are of course not exclusive. Students who receive scholarships to offset disadvantage have to have performed exceptionally well to reach our entry levels. So it is both about academic achievement and about recognizing uh, the, the situations from which people have come. Raising money for such scholarships is a prime focus of the Law School's development program, helping us to give real substance to our commitments to social justice. And we're able to do this thanks to the great generosity of our donors. And, uh, uh, of all of them here tonight, I have to pick out particularly Jenny Green, who manages to pick herself out by wearing a beautiful red shirt in the third row there. Uh, Jenny and John Green's uh, extraordinary generosity was the high point of our 40th anniversary uh, a couple of years ago when they gave us no less than half a million dollars to give uh, for scholarships. So. Um, <laughs> So first, the Juris Doctor Scholarships. These scholarships were donated by the faculty to assist people coming into our JD program to ensure that it has the broadest range of people that we can. It includes an Indigenous JD scholarship, which is part of our long-standing commitment to supporting Indigenous students in coming to law school and finishing their degrees. This year, the JD scholarships were awarded to Jade, Jade Carter Bond, who can't be here tonight, to Tan Hien Doan, to Therese Harcher, who's not here, and Teela Reid. So if, the, if uh, Jade, <laughs> sorry, if Tan and Teela, can come. congratulations. <laughs> the UNSW Law Society Scholarship, this is uh, donated by our students to support their own colleagues. It was begun with a personal donation from the former VC, John Nyland, and since then our students have contributed over $20,000 to his original gift. And the scholarship recognizes outstanding undergraduate students. I particularly recognize those currently responsible for running the Law Society, Cara Grimsley and Nathan Wynn, the Law Society co-presidents who do an extraordinary job for us. And this year's award of the UNSW Law Society Scholarship goes to Piero Craney. <laughs> the, um, an award which is very close to the hearts of, of a number of us here, the Louise Brown Memorial Award. Louise was a, an academically gifted young woman with a very strong sense of ethics and social justice. She was, in many ways for me, the exemplar of the, a UNSW law student. Uh, in April 2011, she, was, she died tragically in Paris where she was on exchange at Sciences Po. Louise was committed to using law for humanitarian causes, which she'd done through a, a, a massive amount of things in her young life. Her legacy as an advocate for human rights will live on through this award and by assisting other students to become involved in social justice advocacy. And I particularly acknowledge the, those responsible for this award in organizing it. Uh, Nick Carney again and Helen Carney in the second row here, Louise Brown's cousin and aunt, both UNSW, uh, closely associated with UNSW. This year, the, the Louise Brown Award goes to Talina Herzler. The 
Paul Donnelly Memorial Scholarship. Uh, this scholarship was awarded by uh, my friend, colleague, and previous dean, Professor Paul Redmond, with a significant personal donation in, in memory of a member of his family. Paul was just telling me the, the story about this, which I, I didn't know about until tonight, that it's in memory of Paul Donnelly, uh, who died age 19 as a prisoner of war in the Second World War. The scholarship marks his sacrifice and that of others like him, whose brief lives powerfully enlarged the opportunities of others. Through this scholarship, his family seeks to support Indigenous Australians studying law at UNSW, as these studies are often completed through heroic determination and courage of their own. So I'd like to firstly to acknowledge Paul Redmond sitting at the, uh, at the bottom of the, 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 the row over there, um, sitting modestly making sure nobody recognises him. Thank you, Paul. And the, the award this year goes to Tamara Kenny. Dixon Family Scholarship, we've talked about the Dixon family or, already. This one is intended to encourage and assist UNSW arts law students to get most out of their uni university experience as the Dixons feel they had the great fortune to do. So I acknowledge via uh, Ross Dixon, I acknowledge her family. This year's award goes to Bridget McManus. The John Kirkwood Memorial Scholarship. This was established with donations from the Kirkwood family and from uh, UNSW law staff and students in memory of John Kirkwood, who was a lecturer in, in the law school. His commitment to legal education is able to carry on as it has been given for now more than 27 years. This year's award goes to Jasper Niagara. The next award, which just reached staying here because he's getting that one too. <laughs> the Lillian Cohen Memorial Scholarship was donated by Janet Donald in memory of her mother, who is passionate about young people and learning. Uh, and this year there are two scholarships. Uh, I acknowledge Janet Donald for her role in this scholarship. Firstly to Jaspreet, as I said, and secondly to Emily Wooden. Now to the John M. M. Green Scholarship in Law, donated as I just I mentioned by John and Jenny Green, both alumni of UNSW. John's family arrived from Europe after the war, war with nothing and he told us that UNSW Law opened doors for him to an extraordinarily successful career both in the law and most recently as a, an author um, of his latest book was, uh, was launched last night and I urge everybody to rush out to the bookshops to buy it. Um, it's the, the John Green Scholarship is designed to help students reach their potential and the Greens tell us as a thank you to the law school. So thank you back to Jenny and this year's award is to Blake Osmond. Keep an eye on this young man. I don't know where he's going to end up, but I can tell you it's going to be somewhere extraordinary. Um, the Dorothy Hughes Memorial Scholarship was donated by friends and family of Dorothy Hughes, who was a legal aid lawyer working with Indigenous Australian clients. The scholarship assists an Indigenous law student in the third, fourth or fifth year to complete their degree. And this year's award goes to Corey Smith. It's the, the opportunity to recognise the students who came top of the, their, their classes across the law school curriculum. So I'd invite students who are on the Dean's list to assemble at that side of the stage. 
and we'll have an opportunity to, to recognize them. Um, please bear with us for a, a, a moment while we, we go through a little stage of chaos while I shake the hands and recognize the achievement of all these wonderful students. It's, a, it's an exceptional achievement by each one of those people who are here tonight. M many of them, as you'll see in your program, have won more than one, one, one uh, prize.
Thanks, everybody. Do, unless anybody else wants to come up to shake my hand, I'm open to offers. Uh, I'd like to just make a couple of closing remarks just to thank all the staff, academic and professional and technical, who've contributed to making tonight's event possible, particularly our, our wonderful marketing and development team and uh, the colleagues from Student Services. Uh, thanks. Again, just to repeat myself, uh, I'd like to thank the donors of our prizes and scholarships. Like the Law School, they recognize the importance of acknowledging excellence and challenging disadvantage, and I'm very grateful to them for making tonight's celebration possible. Uh, thank you also to the parents, families, and friends of our students who've come along tonight to support them, not just tonight, but all the way through their studies. We, we really value what you do for our students. And finally, again, congratulations to all our students for their amazing achievements. And now, that's the end of the, the evening's formal proceedings, but I hope that you'll join us upstairs on level one uh, to meet people and to tell stories about your time now or in the past at law school. So thank you all for coming this evening. And good night. <laughs>